interrupting if we leave the door open. Okay, so let's get started. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Marjorie Gerhardt and as my surname does not indicate, I am a lecturer in French studies, but I grew up in Alsace, which is very close to the German border. If anyone um, has heard of Strasbourg, that's very close to where I grew up. And I'm also the admissions tutor for the Department of Modern Languages and um, the European Studies. So I'll be giving this short presentation today to give you an idea of, um, try to give you uh, some information about what it's like to study at the University of Reading. I hope everyone is here for a Modern Languages degree information. If not, now is the time to go. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> you'll stand here with me for 40, 45 minutes. But also with um, Sofia, who is one of our um, second year now, Spanish and Italian um, student, and Ellie, who is a final year student, she's just finished her final exams and is waiting to get her results and to graduate um, in a few days' time. So they're going to come and contribute um, as well, telling you things from a perspective of the students, which is probably what you're most interested in, and not hearing um, just from me. So first, just before we start uh, talking about Reading specifically, why study languages? Um, between six and seven thousand languages are spoken worldwide at the moment. I think it's closer to seven thousand. So it's quite a lot of languages. Uh, does anyone know what percentage of the uh, popula world population speaks English as a first language? Roughly. How many people have English as their first language? The native speaking. Come in. <laughs> Any guesses? Sorry? 25%? 25%! Ooh, that's very generous. A bit less than that. <laughs> Optimistic, yeah? 100%. 100%, that's a bit hard. <laughs> it's closer to 6% of the world population. So having English as their first language, it does not mean that um, only 6% of the world population can speak English, but for most people it's going to be a second um, or even a third language. Uh, actually, only about 75% of the world's population speak uh, 75% of the world's population don't speak English at all. So that is a, a lot of people. And in a global, um, connected world, it's really important that we can also communicate with people in their own language and not just expect them to speak English, even if, if English is a global language. So well done, all of you, for being interested in learning a language, because I think it shows a lot of foresight and um, I think it's an asset in today's uh, global world as well. Right, why study languages and which languages in particular? According to this report by the British Council, which was published in 2013, these are the 10 languages that have been identified as the most important to the UK over the next 20 years, not just in terms of the economy, but also in terms of diplomatic relations um, and cultural links as well. And quite a few of them, and you can see that the four languages that we focus on in the Department of Modern Languages um, and European Studies all feature um, in this list of 10 languages. Actually, quite a few of the other languages that are mentioned here, uh, definitely Arabic, Mandarin, Chinese, Russian, I think, um, are also taught at the university in um, a department called Institution-Wide Language Programme, IWLP. If you haven't been to their stall, they have a stall in the big dome, this inflatable structure. Um, they, have a, they have a stall, they're called IWLP, um, and our students, some of our students take another language um, as part of their degree, uh, and they started with the IWMP, or they do it in their spare time, and there's a small fee uh, if you want to do it as a hobby, but it can be quite a good thing as well, especially if you want to do international relations, for instance. Um, quite a few of our students, and Anthony, who's doing international relations, would recommend it as well, I think. Uh, so yeah, these are some of the languages uh, that you can do at the university of Reading. But why Reading in particular? Um, today's a nice day, it's sunny for once, usually on an open day it's awful, uh, but today we've got sunshine and it's just awful on an open day because most of the time I find that the weather in Reading, I don't know what our students would say, uh, but having lived in the southwest for eight years before coming to Reading, there's a lot less rain in Reading. Um, so it's great, we've got a really green campus and we're very proud of our campus. We've, r we've won uh, a green flag award for the sixth consecutive year this year um, and we've got various um, certifications as well because the campus is actually a really beautiful place. There's 130 hectares uh, of Greenland and Park and the lake as well. If you haven't been to the lake yet, it's a really nice area. If you find that the blinds are distracting you, Anthony can go and close the windows <laughs> if it's becoming annoying. Um, anyone? Is that, is that okay with the blinds flopping? 
Yeah, okay. Just raise your hand if you need Anthony to come to the rescue. Um, this is a photo from the Harris Garden. It's a, it's a hidden garden um, at the back of campus. It's actually not very far, but if you have a second, I would recommend going there. It's very peaceful. And not now, but uh, a bit earlier in the year, they have this beautiful, um, this beautiful tulip meadow in the cherry circle with lots of cherry trees around. So students like to go there and revise. I don't know if you guys have been there. Yes, but if you, yeah, if you haven't been, you should definitely go. It's a very nice garden. Uh, a few words about the history of the university. So, um, Univers the University of Reading started off as an Oxford college in 1892, so quite a long time ago. Uh, and we were given a royal charter in 1926, so that's about 90, 91 years ago now. So we're quite a well-established university. We have about 17,000 students at the moment, so quite um, a big university but sort of remaining as a manageable human, human size. We have a very diverse student community as well, which makes for a vibrant, um, dynamic um, atmosphere, I think, for our students. And there is an Erasmus Society, for instance, so a, a lot of incoming Erasmus students meet with our existing students and can practice their languages together. So that works um, really well. We also a growing university. Um, I think nationwide there has been a decrease in applications uh, since 2014, especially a 3% decrease, whereas at Reading we're uh, increasing, so we've, got an, we've seen a 9% increase recently. But in modern languages, we're very aware that you can't really learn the language in the lecture theatre with 70 or 100 people. So we're trying to keep our student numbers at a <coughs> human size um, so that you don't end up with 25 people in language class, for instance. So it's managing... Um, being a growing department, but also um, being able to know our students individually. And I think that's something that I heard you say um, early, Anthony, that you felt like you, your teachers know you personally, and it's not just, you're not just a you're student not a number. number. Yeah. You're not just a number. So that's something that is really close to our hearts, I think, uh, to know our students and to be able to support them um, individually as well. We're also located very close to Reading, uh, the town, the town centre, um, it's about what, seven minutes on the bus, something like that, not during rush hour. Um, there's also very good train connections with London and other parts of the country. Heathrow is about 40 minutes away. Um, yeah, London is 25 minutes away on the train. Um, and it's, it's a very vibrant city as well, lots of um, shops and restaurants. And I think there's a beach now by the Oracle. They've put some sand there. So that's, that's a new feature of Reading. Um, I don't know how this is going to work but it sounds quite, um, quite appealing. But I think for our students it's quite good because they can reach town very easily. Um, and yet on campus, they're in a familiar, um, safe environment here as well. Now, what our students say about, about us, about the Department of Modern Languages specifically, these are some quotes, um, recent quotes from our students. Some of them are from the National Student Survey for 2016. We haven't got the results for 2017 yet. Uh, but you can see that they're consistently happy with their studies, which is, um, which is good. And I'm going to ask Sophia now to actually give her point of view as, an, as a current student um, in the department. Okay. Here is the remote. Okay, so, hi guys. Um, my name is Sophia. I'm a second year Italian and Spanish student here at the department. Um, as you can see, this is, uh, this is me in all my housemates um, in freshers last year, having lots of fun. Um, I'm just going to try and give you uh, a sense of what it's like being a student. Obviously, I'm going to relay more of my experience. Um, so your first week when you arrive, um, freshers week, probably intense, but great fun. Um, your moving in will, will be a little bit stressful, but really, really exciting. Um, it's a really a chance, week one, for you to get familiar with the department, with your lecturers, with your housemates in particular, and becoming really familiar with the place. Um, you're going to be spending a lot of time in the dome, I know I did. Every chance I got, I went, oh, there was module fairs, career fairs, um, work experience. So you're spending a lot of time in the dome in your first week. And, of course, freshers, which is lots of fun. Um, accommodation. Um, there's lots of type of accommodation on campus, um, from high end to sort of low end. Still reasonable price, but um, I stayed in the St Pat's, which was just off campus. Um, it wasn't most most glamorous of places, I, I must admit. But 
I had a lot of fun and all of um because all the flats were basically all open and it, we weren't sort of segregated into flats and yeah I made made so many good friends. Um these are just pictures of this is Makinda, um this one is Wessex. So if you get a chance to have a look at accommodation please do and it's a really good chance just to get familiar with accommodation. Um, in terms of my academic life, um, you know, the Department of Modern Languages is really, as, as, as Anthony was saying, and Marjorie is a community, and I really feel like um, it has benefited my experience so much. Um, all the lectures have been at the end of an email, everyone's been so supportive, the help paid me to say this by the way, but <laughs> but um, it honestly has made all the difference and again we're not a number, everyone knows me by name, um, if I don't turn up to a lecture I do get told off. Um, the library at the moment is being refurbished and unfortunately you won't be able to um, go in, uh, well, see it today, it should be finished by 2019, but it, what, it is a really great place to, um, to study, to work. Also socialising in a way, even though you're not supposed to be socialising, but it, um, it, it, all the facilities are there, all the books are there, and um, yeah, it's just a great place to, to work. The personal tutor scheme, is, um, well, relationship is great as well, because you are allocated an, ac uh, an academic, a lecturer, who will then follow you throughout your degree, and if any problems that you may have to do with your luck, or health, safe, or health and safety, or your modules, they are the first report of call. And there's lots of extra curriculum activities to do, especially as a student. I know I took part in the Red Award, which is a um, scheme given to you by to, to students to basically encourage you to do work placements and um, volunteering schemes. Just a few words about campus. Um, obviously, today is lovely and green um, and sunny. Again, all the facilities that you will have will be on campus. You've got banks, supermarkets. One particular building that I know that I took advantage of is the Carrington Building, which is uh, <coughs> focusing on helping you um, develop skills for your um, CV, um, even actually devising your CV, which helps you um, then later to find jobs and stuff. And Rusu and places to eat and things like that. And lastly, just uh, a few words about Reading Town. Um, again, it's only seven minutes away. I live in accommodation just off campus now in an eight bed. I literally, it takes 10, min 10 minutes to walk to town, 10, 15 minutes, um, which is great. Again, so I'm from London, I can get to go home within an hour and I'm there. And again, if I wanted to go see my friends in Birmingham, Manchester, it is really easy to do that. Um, Great bars, great restaurants, um, and lots of going out places. <laughs> um, yeah, and um, should be any, anybody questions? Please let me know. No, no. And yeah, you'll have the rest of uh, the morning or even the afternoon and the lunch break to talk to our student ambassadors um, and ask them any questions that you might have. Um, Okay, so as Sophia said, um, sorry, as, yes, as Sophia said, I saw Ellie running away, I thought, oh, um, but yes, as Sophia said, we, we really um, think of ourselves as a community of learners, so regardless of the language that you're learning, whether you're learning one language, two languages with us, uh, you're part of this community, and we actually have quite a few events um, that we have that bring together all of the students in our department. Um, this is um, all, all of our teaching. Everything that we do is underpinned by excellence in research. So as members of staff, we are teachers, but we are also researchers, um, the great majority of us. And as you can see from this league table, in the latest REF, the Research Excellence Framework, uh, it's like an Ofsted for research, if you want. So as uh, the research side of our work is being assessed, uh, and the latest one was in 2014. I think they run every seven or eight years, so we're not due for another one just yet, thankfully. Um, but we submitted all of our staff at Reading. Some other universities were a bit cheeky and they only uh, returned or submitted half of their staff or two thirds of their staff and got higher in the rankings. But on intensity, which is the quality of our research mitigated by the number of staff that were returned, we came fifth in the UK, which we're very proud of. Um, now, these are some of the books that we've recently published. So as uh, members of staff, as researchers, we have research interests. Mine, for instance, is the history of philanthropy 
in France and uh, the history of the First World War, so that's my expertise. It does not mean that I only teach about these subjects, even though I love them. Uh, I do teach the second year French his, uh, First World War module, by the way, if anyone is interested. Uh, but what difference does it make to our students? I think it really benefits our students because they are taught by people who are passionate in their subjects, uh, people who are experts in their subjects, and also we can, it means that we do organise quite a lot of activities outside of the classroom that our students can attend. So we had um, last year, for instance, or this year just gone, uh, one of my colleagues is working on um, translating in NGOs. So she organised a series of seminars on translating in danger zones, and these were open to staff but also to students. And she invited lots of people from uh, translators or interpreters without borders, people working with refugees, asylum seekers, etc. So our students can talk to these people, can meet with these people. Um, first hand and we also uh, occasionally have work placements so when we get funding for one of our research projects sometimes we can hire um, a student to help us with, with it over the summer if they want to um, but obviously yes, seminars, conferences are organised organized on campus and I think that really benefits um, our students as well so it's not just something we do in our spare time um, and as I said we try to be a friendly department this is our head of department Julia, Dr Julia Waters and she's going to give the taster session this afternoon uh, if anyone is planning on staying for the whole day at 2 o'clock from 2 to 2.45 um, Julia is going to give a taster session on one of her first year modules which looks at um, European cinema so that's, uh, that's the head of department um, what can, how do we teach? So what is our approach to teaching? We really focus on small groups, and I heard Ellie say earlier that in, you're doing French and English literature, right? That in English literature, sometimes you have 100 people in a lecture theatre. That is very unusual for modern languages. In our first year, we recruited, in 20, this year, we had 123 students starting, but across all four languages. So it's very unusual to have 123 students in the classroom. I think it probably happened in one of your... Um, modules in language skills possibly uh, but that's the only time that was sort of 10 times throughout the year <laughs> I think so we, we try to focus on small groups um, we teach using um, a variety of methods so we have lectures lectures is what we're doing now I'm talking at you and you're trying to not fall asleep <laughs> um, we also have seminars so all of our cultural modules history, literature, cinema um, usually have seminars as well, so these will be in smaller groups. So for instance, in my first year introduction to French history module, we have about 40, I don't know if anyone is doing it here, I don't think so, Emily might be doing it, but she's gone. Uh, we had about 40 students in the lecture, and then in the seminars it was closer to fewer than 20. So the seminars are really to discuss, uh, give presentations, um, and talk things in more depth, ask questions. Um, in language classes, obviously, that's different. Again, we try to have um, smaller groups. Um, so I was talking to a German colleague. They have between sort of 10 and 15 students usually in German. So it depends a little bit on the year, but in language classes, I don't know how many people are in your language class at the moment if you're doing a language. Is it closer to 1 or closer to 20? Who has more than 10 people in their language class if you're doing a language? More than 10? Okay, one person. <laughs> who, has, who has fewer than 5? Quite a few, okay. So if I say 10 to 15 people in the classroom, that seems like quite a lot, <laughs> uh, in fact. That's, that's usually the, the average number of people that we have in a language class, so we have smaller groups than seminars. Uh, in terms of the assessment methods that we use, we try to use different methods of assessment because not everyone performs well under exam conditions. Uh, not everyone is writing, uh, writing essays or giving presentations. So usually for each module, you're assessed at least for two different methods. Most of the time it's going to be free. Um, it can be exams and essays. These are the more traditional forms. It can be oral presentations. It might be posters, presentation, uh, radio show we had this year. Um, there was, in German, a new exercise which was writing in a dictionary entry, uh, worth 10% as well, which apparently went really well. So we try to use a variety of, um, of methods to assess our students as well. So this is just to give you an idea of how uh, we teach. In terms of our programmes, we try to be really flexible and allow students to tailor their programme to their own interests. We're trying to be um, quite flexible there. You might have seen, if you've grabbed one of our brochures, um, there's a list of all the combinations that you can take. So we have joint programmes with um, another language, so you can do two languages, French and Spanish, German and Italian, etc. 
Um, you can do join honors with economics, English language, English literature. New for 2018, you can do A language with comparative literature. There is a flyer for that, and it looks like this. If anyone is interested, it gives you more information um, about our joint with comparative literature, uh, joint with history, international relations, management. Um, there's an IMBA as well, um, and classics, but that's just for Italian. And from this year onwards, we have a new opt-in language and QTS program. That's another flyer for this. I'm bombarding you with information. Come and talk to me at the end, and I can repeat anything um, that you're particularly interested in. This QTS program is for people who are really interested in becoming teachers, especially secondary uh, teacher, <coughs> and secondary teachers in the, sec in the secondary um, school level. And the way it works is that you apply in the first year for any of our programs, and in the second year uh, there's a selection, you have to apply again, um, and if you are selected to join this language and QTS program, you effectively split your time between studying one or two languages and studying um, education, basically, with the Institute of Education. So it's like a joint degree between language and education. Um, unfortunately, if you are doing French and history in the first year, you can't continue, you have to drop the history component. But if someone is really keen to become a teacher, that can be a really good way uh, of doing that, because by the time you graduate, at the end of your fourth year, you have the qualified teacher status. Uh, so you can go straight into teaching. It's quite good. Currently, the fourth year is funded by the Department for Education, but we cannot guarantee that this is going to continue because they review that every year. Uh, but apart from that, it's, um, it's quite an intense program because you go and do placements in the school. So you start, you finish later in July than other people. Uh, you start earlier at the end of August so that you can do your school placements. But it's a really, I think it's a really rewarding program. I'm really proud to be, I think, one of about half a dozen of uh, UK universities who've been granted funding by the Department for Education to launch this program. So. Um, but in terms of applying, you apply for any of our programs uh, in the first year and then you apply again to join this program in the second year. So these are some of our um, new developments and come and talk to me if you have any questions about them. In terms of our curriculum, as I've already said, we have a variety of modules. There's lots of module flyers which look like these ones, for instance, on the tables. Um, so feel free to have a look at them, take one home, sometimes there's the email address of the module convener, so if you have a question about this particular module on the genius of Italy, do email Paola Nasti, um, because she will be able to tell you more about that. Um, but we try to have to cover different areas, history, cinema, linguistics, uh, literature, all sorts of different things. There's a module on French chanson. French philosophy as well. I talk more about French because obviously I teach in French. But we have colleagues from other languages who are going to come back in a moment. We also offer comparative modules, and that's something which I think is quite unique to Reading, and it's also something we're quite proud about uh, and proud of. Um, so in all three years, there's the option of taking a comparative module, and that's a module looking at not just one country, one culture in isolation, but looking at them uh, in comparison. And I think, Anthony, you're taking the making of modern Europe right in the first year. So that's a history of Europe module, basically. In the first year, we also have, at the moment, an introduction to linguistics module and a module on European cinema. So especially if you're doing two languages or language and international relations, it can be really helpful to take one of those comparative modules because they help you compare um, different um, national contexts. Uh, there's more flyers about these comparative modules as well. We try to have a global outlook so we're aware that French is not only spoken in France and Spanish is not only spoken in Spain, spoken in Spain. so we try to include Latin America, uh, the French Caribbean, and I think I was talking to someone earlier, one of our exchange universities for French um, for the Erasmus programme is in La Réunion, so like the Reunion Island in the Indian Ocean. So we try to have this um, global outlook because being aware as well that students when they graduate might want to go and work elsewhere, somewhere exotic uh, for instance. And our head of department, Julia, you saw her photo earlier, she's an expert in French literature of the Indian Ocean. So in the, fir in the final year she teaches a module which looks more at French literature of the Caribbean, but this is the kind of modules that we include. We have a colleague in Spanish, Pa, who was here earlier, you might have met her. She's an expert in um, Cuban cultural history. Another one of my colleagues in, Sp in Spanish, Katrina, she's working on Argentina. Um, so we, we try to have this global outlook, not just focus on uh, Europe, even though there are obviously modules on France and Spain, um, etc. 
We also try to encourage archive-based teaching. Um, and our students actually really enjoy working with um, actual material and not just looking at PowerPoints. So we're very fortunate to have um, the Museum of English Rural Life and um, wide collections of archives on our London Road campus. So we sometimes take our students there to work um, together. We go on research, we go on trips with them as well, so to the Imperial War Museum um, and to various other places. We have award-winning teaching staff, and I'm very sad that no one from uh, my no one from my Italian colleagues here, because they just got an award for outstanding teaching last year. Um, but we're very proud. We're trying, but we're trying to improve um, still every year. And we also have a very well-established personal tutor system, as Sophia was saying. So every new student is paired with an academic, and they meet uh, in the first week, uh, freshers' week, and then again once a term. Uh, regularly, but more regularly if there is a need, so uh, if someone, I don't know, I had a student, for instance, a tutee who um, fell during the summer and then had a, a plaster cast, so she needed help to liaise with disability office, to arrange lifts, etc. So this is the kind of things that a personal tutor can help with. A personal tutor also knows the student very well, so they usually tend to write reference letters when people are looking for jobs uh, later on. But this is something that we have as well. Uh, we try to <laughs> give people um, value for the money. So extracurricular activities, I've mentioned this um, seminar series on translating in danger zones earlier. These are uh, some of the other things that we've done. So that's the um, translating in danger zone series. We had this year uh, a fortnightly cinema club called, I think it's called Cinema and Chat, but you can correct me, CNC. And the idea was to show the film in the target language with English subtitles so that anyone who doesn't speak the language can come as well and then have a discussion after the film, uh, either in English if people did not speak the language or uh, in the target language, so that was every other week. Uh, we had a talk on surrealism as well, which was closely connected with uh, one of our first year modules. They had a medieval banquet in the Genius of Italy module, I think, so we're trying to have extracurricular activities organised by the department, but obviously there's languages societies which are student-led as well, and the Erasmus Society, and that's not something that the department controls but we strongly encourage uh, students to participate in them as well. Um, employability, that's something that the university as a whole is really keen on at the moment, and Sophia mentioned uh, the career service in the Carrington building, which can provide a lot of help with CVs, uh, cover letters, etc. As language staff, we also help students write their CVs or cover letters in the language if they're planning on doing a work placement in the year abroad. So the careers office is more for um, things written in English. I don't think they can advise that much on um, foreign languages there. We also have within the school something called the professional track. Again, we have a few uh, flyers, so do grab one if you want to. And that's the idea is that uh, it's free for students to join. Most of the activities are free, uh, so you can have things like introduction to uh, marketing, uh, introduction to journalism, introduction to teaching and the short sessions. There was also a leadership course this year that I took part in. So we're providing that to our students. Um, there are a few activities which I think incur a cost, like first aid, for instance, because we're bringing people from St. John's Ambulance or the Red Cross. So if students want to attend that, there, there might be a cost uh, involved. But do pick one of these up if you want to. But that, that is, again, to try and get our students to think a little bit about um, their future careers and to prepare them as best as, um, as we can. Dedicated Year Abroad team, and in a second I'm going to hand over to Ellie. <laughs> uh, the Year Abroad is an integral part of our degree, of our, all of our degrees actually, the third year, uh, is spent abroad and really fortunate to have a great member of staff, her name is Sarah Lodge, and she's our Year Abroad Administrator, and she has all the answers about the Year Abroad. She's really good at reminding students of the deadlines, of saying, have you filled in your Erasmus scholarship form, etc., and managing all the paperwork, uh, the agreements if you're going on the work placement, etc. So um, that's, we have an admin member of staff. We also have a year abroad coordinator for the department and different uh, coordinators for each language. So there is a lot, there's a very strong structure uh, in place to coordinate the year abroad. And in fact, we're quite proud to say that we were one of the first in the UK to offer the year abroad. I believe it was in the 1930s. Um, so, you know, minus a couple of years during wars, etc. Um, we've been delivering the year abroad for about 75 years, and that was long before the EU um, was founded. Um, so, 
we have a long experience of delivering the year abroad, and we think it's a very useful and enriching and rewarding experience. But Ellie can say more about that now. So. Okay, hey everyone, I am Ellie. What? I'm gonna. I can't really condense a year of my life into five minutes, but I'm gonna try. Um, before you go, you get so much support, so I was quite nervous about this, but basically, second year, you get there and you're already thinking about where you're going to go. So your plans start in second year in autumn term, you start, everything is explained to you basically in these meetings that you have to go to, um, that explain your options. So your options will be university placement, or a teaching assistantship, or work placement, which usually you do have to kind of sort out yourself. Because it's quite complicated, but I personally did the university placement, and I think that is what, well, that's the only thing I can really talk about. Um, I chose um, one of many destinations. You could have gone to so many places, and even like next year, like the list has just got bigger. Um, beforehand as well, um, I personally spoke to people who were in fourth year, so they'd just come back, and I was like, I need to speak to these people right now. Um, and they gave me advice on where to go. So because I spoke to them, I chose my destination based on what they told me. Um, a Facebook group was set up as well just for us. So like basically everyone before year abroad um, was part of this group. So like Facebook's so easy to use. We were all in contact with our teachers and each other. So like I, don't, I never really felt like I was alone. Um, the language classes that you have in second year are really small, just like always, like I was always in a really tiny class, and I think that worked best for me because it meant I could just ask as many questions as I wanted, and it didn't matter. Um, has already mentioned the year abroad coordinator, she literally saved my life so many times. I, she actually rang me when I was on my year abroad to explain my course to me, like, my modules were quite complicated because I do French and English literature, so it was like, I didn't know what to choose, she rang me and all of my teachers explained everything to me. How do you like this? It's the arrow. Yeah. 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 Um, so, yeah, my year abroad, I chose Lyon. Um, it's really close to Italy and Switzerland. I cannot tell you enough how beautiful this place is. Um, I lived in between the two rivers. They had the Horn and the Sun. Um, basically, the transport system was amazing. I can't even explain it to you because it's too good, but I took pictures the whole time I was there, so quite a lot of this presentation is like in my pictures that I took. Um, it even had a park with a zoo, so pretty much like most of the destinations personally I know from France were like really adaptable, like you could have chose quite a small place, but I wanted to go to a city, so I chose Lyon. Um, there was so, like basically, because it was such a big city, there was like lots of different unis, so I know people who went to Sciences Po, so like if you do um, international relations or politics, like a lot of my friends went to that one, because it was much more specific. I do literature, so I went to uh, University, uh, Université Lumière Lyon 2, I haven't speak French very just since, but we're saying that. Um, but yeah, basically that suited me fine because all of the stuff that was at the uni was suitable for me because I do English. So I was studying what I do in English here, but in French. So I was still like keeping that side of my degree. Um, so yeah, I went, there's so many unis to choose from, you can usually select where you go. Um, in terms of accommodation, I was very scared about this. So I made it my business to find my house in July. I was already looking online. I messaged like a couple of people, but that was the website I used. And I ended up living with French people who were working. They didn't really speak English that much, so I had to do a really embarrassing Skype interview and try and like pretend to speak French, even though my French was quite bad at that point. But um, it improved so much. So what I'm going to say to you is that living with French people and finding an accommodation like this early, like basically changed my whole experience. Like my whole my level of language improved so much just from my decision choosing my um, choosing my accommodation at this point. So basically, with because I did university, I was part of the Erasmus Society. They look after you. I was a bit scared, but you turn up and everyone just looks after you. The people are like um, multilingual. So basically, I had to speak a little bit of English when I first got there because I was quite scared. But they are so helpful. They organise nights out, trips. I went to Disneyland. I think at Christmas time I went skiing, and I've never been before, and it was so bad. I really hurt myself loads of times, but. It was fun and it was really cheap. So obviously you get a lot more um, money from your Erasmus grant, you get more student loans, so like it was very affordable. 
and obviously both unis, like, I was always in contact with Reading and the uni I was at at the same time, so, like, there was not really any way that I was gonna, um, like, be alone. You can't really be alone, you've got people to email, you've got people to talk to, so these are just, like, a few of the pictures, um, that I collected, so that's my flat up there, and just, Leon was beautiful, like, I can't, I'm a little bit biased, because I love it. Um, so my survival guide would be just basically to keep in contact with Reading and just make sure you are using the facilities that are here. So Sarah Lodge helped me like incredibly. I don't even I can't even say thank you enough to her. Um, and just all of my teachers really because they were they would reply to my email within like 20 minutes. So I was never alone. So the staff helped me. Actually, it surprised me, but at the uni I went to, like, the lady was really nice in the office and she was really patient with me, even though my French was really bad. And I really didn't understand what she was saying sometimes, because they do speak very quickly when you first get there. But um, the Erasmus support network basically helped me and my language grow, because it is about confidence. I think I was very unconfident when I first got there. But what I can say that I achieved is, like, a lot, basically. Um, I know that I'm independent and self-motivated now. I had to open bank accounts, phone contracts, speak people on the phone. I had to do everything in French and obviously in a second language it is quite um, difficult at first. But by Christmas I un <coughs> understood most of what was going on. So for me, I was delighted for that. Um, as well, like I met so many people from all over the world, like not just France. I had a lot of French friends um, because a lot of my classes were in just with loads of French people, I was like the only foreign person there sometimes. Um, but that was good, because I made a lot of friends, a lot of my Erasmus friends I still speak to, like I just met up with my friend the other day in London, which was really good. Um, and my CV, obviously, I feel like nowadays it's really quite important to have something special on your CV, because quite a lot of people do have a degree, but a language is going to set you apart. So if I had to do a job speaking on the phone in French, I could do that now. I've lived there for a year, I stayed from August till... August. I stayed there for a whole year and I did everything in French and my level was like quite intermediate when I first got there so I would definitely say like the main focus for me was to improve my language and I absolutely did that. So um, travelling independently I spent 20 hours on Megabus to get to England because I forgot to buy flights to go home for Christmas but I've done a lot of flying on my own I never did that before. Um, and I had to carry my bed all the way across Leon because uh, sometimes you don't have like, um, I didn't realise, but the rooms aren't furnished. So I went on the buying and selling website, bought myself a double bed and got my friend to help me carry it all across the metro, but it was fine. And yeah, and it was really cheap. So the last thing that I've really achieved from it is just priceless memories. And like, I'm pretty much bilingual now. I've just finished my degree and I can't like I can't express enough how important it is to just go for it and just definitely study mm -hmm. especially at Reading because I've really had a good time here but yeah so I think that's all I've got to say about me. any so, questions Bernie? yeah does anyone have any specific it is like quite a broad topic I feel like if you do want to speak to me after then I'm definitely around we're going to be in the dome quite a lot if you'd like to go there so okay. give that back to thank you thank you very much thank you. Thank you. okay and I should probably specify um, that you can go so we encourage all of our students to secure an Erasmus place, so a place at the uni at a university, but then uh, there's also the possibility to apply uh, to become a teaching assistant with the British Council um, and to apply to uh, do a work placement, and as Ellie said, we cannot guarantee that everyone is going to get a work placement, but we encourage, uh, we support people and we help them with writing CVs and cover letters, we give them details of companies that have recruited some of our year abroad students in the past, so we give support and help with that, but we can't guarantee everyone's going to get a work placement. Um, and what I should also say is that I squeezed through uh, my list of destinations, but we have a few um, brochures over there for each language, and there's a list of partner universities in each of the brochures. So for Spanish, for instance, we have um, a partnership with Havana, a university in Havana. Sophia, are you going there next year? Yes, she is. Uh, we go to Havana for half a year, is that right? Uh, we have a partnership with a university in Mexico, and I'm not going to attempt to say the name of the uni this university. Something like that. <laughs> Pueblo, something like that? Pueblo, yeah. Yeah, that one. Um, and one in Buenos Aires as well. Um, and for French, we have pa partnerships with Geneva and with uh, La Réunion as well as Aspect. So we try to have uh, partnerships with universities, not just uh, in France, in Spain. Um, for German, we have, um, I think we might have Austrian universities as well as German ones. 
but uh, don't quote me on that. So the destinations are all in the brochure, so do have a look and talk to our students and staff, and they can tell you more um, about that. Okay, so for the rest of today, I'm going to stop talking in a second. Yes, I've almost managed to finish by quarter two, uh, but just to invite you to join us for a taster session, as I mentioned earlier, delivered by Julia Waters at two o'clock in this room. It's going to last for about 45 minutes, and it's based on one of our first year modules called Grace of the European Cinema, so do come back for that if you want to get a taster for the kind of comparative modules that we offer. Um, also, advert um, for a university preview day. So this is something that uh, we've organised and which is going to take place on the 28th. And we have some um, flyers over there as well. They look actually uh, very much like this. So if you're interested, email Katie Green, who's our outreach officer. Uh, grab a flyer and um, if you want to book a place, you don't need to go via a school or anything. Um, please do come and the focus is going to be on migration and integration because quite a lot of our staff research these areas um, of migration and integration and there's also going to be a taste session um, for learning Italian from beginners level so if anyone is interested in that do sign up, it's free of charge but we need people to book just to have an idea of how many people are coming so do grab a flyer and contact um, Katie one last reminder as well, you're going to be sent an open day survey, and this is a standard slide that I have to include in my presentation, <laughs> but we, uh, we send you an open day survey, so if you can fit it in, that would be great uh, to help us improve our op uh, open day experience. And if you want to stay in touch with the department specifically, we have a Facebook page where you can see the kind of, especially extracurricular activities that we offer. Um, we have a Twitter um, account as well and an Instagram account and if you want to talk to me specifically um, I'm the admissions tutor so if it's admissions related um, feel free to email me also if you have any questions about um, is it 50-50 for this course uh, what kind of modules can I take um, my email address is languages at reading.ac.uk so you can contact me directly and I think that's all uh, for now so do stay um, do talk to our student ambassadors, do ask me questions, I'm going to have colleagues who will come back, one colleague from each uh, language if you want to talk to members of staff, have a look at our module flyers um, and enjoy the rest of your day and thank you for coming. Okay.